Tonight we're going to be focusing on the rapture of the church. Um, it's a topic that we'd have heard of many times over. We just want to explore a little bit more this glorious hope that the church has, this wonderful, blessed hope. The Bible describes it as that the church has in Christ Jesus. I hope that we cherish not in vain. And we are grateful that the Lord has in store a plan for us, the church of the living God. So, our lesson is going to be coming to us from the Epistle of Thessalonians, Paul writing to them, and we're going to look at the following objectives that we seek to achieve tonight. We want to look at the rapture of the church. We want to look at the judgment seat of Christ. We want to look at the marriage of the Lamb. And we want to look at Christ reigns with, the church reigns with Christ. All right? The rapture of the church. The church has a glorious future with Christ, as promised at the Last Supper. And he said to the church, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. John 14, 1 through 3, very familiar passage of scripture. Luke's account said this way, in the last appearance of after his resurrection, while they beheld his ascension into the cloud, two men instructed them and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. You're going to see him just like you see him going. Paul describes it as a blessed hope when he linked it together with the coming of Jesus Christ. And so he says in Titus 2, 13 through 14, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. It's a blessed hope that the church has, the rapture of the church. James said, be he also patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And John said it in the last book of the Bible. He which testified these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. He went away not to stay, but he is coming back again. The fact that Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth is an undeniable biblical truth. A truth that brings hope and great joy to the believer. However, not everyone will be happy about his return to earth. For while the scriptures indicate a time of rejoicing for believers, they also indicate a time of great wrath upon the unbelievers. So the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 9, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his presence. So what we're seeing here in one instant but those who have believed the gospel and accepted it and embraced it and practiced it, it will be a glorious time. It will be a wonderful time. But for those who did not believe it, it's going to be judgment. Enoch prophesied 
He says, the, the Bible says, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speech which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's Jude 14 and 15. So we ask ourselves some questions. The question arises as to how his coming can be one of blessing to the church and at the same time, one of judgment upon the earth. And the answer is the, answer is the understanding that the second coming involves two phases. The first phase is when Christ comes to gather his bride, the church, unto himself. While the second phase is when he brings his glorious church back with him to destroy his enemies and set up his kingdom on earth. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 puts it this way. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. What is happening in this text is that the brethren in Thessalonica, their loved ones had passed off. They had died. And they were fearful and wondering when the Lord should return, what's going to happen to them since they are already gone? What, have, what, what hope do they have? And Paul seeks to reassure them through this text that, they, that he should sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So yes, when somebody, when a Christian passes off, there is some level of sorrow that will take place. But we don't sorrow as others who have no hope. Referring to unbelievers. For if we believe that Jesus Christ, that Christ, that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In other words, they have a hope too. They're not left hopeless. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. So when Jesus Christ comes, we who are alive at the time when Jesus comes, we won't prevent persons who have passed on before, our, our brothers and our sisters and our grandparents who have gone on before. We won't prevent them. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead, yes, those who went on before in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, brethren, comfort one another with these words. This particular text speaks to what we call the rapture of the church, the catching away of the church. And so this passage describes, as we said, the rapture of the church. The Greek word for caught up in the text is harpaza and speaks to carrying away, to forcibly snatch or to take away as rescuing from a threatening danger, to grasp something eagerly or quickly with desire. Notice that Christ does not come completely to the earth. It says we're going to meet him in the air during this event. But the saints rise to meet him in the air and to remain with him. In contrast with what Zechariah stated concerning the second coming. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove towards the north and half of it towards the south. So what we have describing here is the rapture of the church separate from what we call the second coming of the church. The rapture of the, take, of the church takes place before what we call the great tribulation. The second coming comes after the tribulation, which is a seven-year period. So right now we're in a, we're in a state of mind, 
in a particular time zone where we are actually anticipating and looking for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the rapture of the church. The parallel passage for 1 Thessalonians is 1 Corinthians 15, 51. And this passage explains how saints who are living when Jesus comes for the church will be able to rise to meet the Lord in the air. Their mortal bodies will be instantly changed to immortal bodies. The Bible says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal put on immortality. There's a change that will take place when the Lord returns for his children. Similar to what happened in Enoch's day, where the Bible says Enoch walked with God. Enoch pleased God, and God took him. In other words, he was translated. He moved from the earth realm into the heavenly realm. God took him from this earth. In a similar way, the church, those who have, been ex who have experienced the born-again experience, washed in his blood, called by his name. We anticipate the great day when the Lord shall come and return for his children. Philippians 3 tells us about this transformation. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things under himself. And so according to the prophecies of Daniel, Israel will make a seven-year covenant with the last world Gentile ruler, the beast, the Antichrist. And the covenant will mark the beginning of God's judgment, his wrath upon the world. It is referred to in both the Old and the New Testament as the day of the Lord. It is also called the time of great tribulation. The details of this coming wrath are given in the book of Revelation from chapters 6 through 19. And that describes what, are going to happen, what is going to happen during the tribulation period, after the church has been taken. The scripture promises that the church will not be a part of the terrible time of judgment. While the church at Thessalonica was presently going through some persecution, Paul assured them that they would escape the coming wrath. The Bible says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how we turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, the great day of the Lord, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, whether we are dead or alive, we should live together with him. Wherefore, brethren, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And so there's a promise that we see this coming is also promised to the Philadelphian church. When we did a couple weeks ago, the church is in Revelation. The Bible says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. We had made mention of the fact that an open door speaks to an open door of evangelism. And so we have this opportunity right now before the Lord returns. The church that is characterized as brotherly love to reach out for the lost and dying. And it is through this reaching that we can experience a great revival, a great harvesting of souls in these last days. In Revelation 3.10, Jesus addressed the church at Philadelphia with this promise. He said, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, 
that hour of temptation speaks to the great tribulation, which shall come upon the world to try them at that dwell upon the earth. <clears throat> Why will the church escape the judgment, we may ask, of the tribulation period? And the Bible talks about the church being a mystery. Ephesians 3, 3 through 10, because the church program is a mystery which began on the day of Pentecost and will end with the rapture. Paul says it in Ephesians 3, 3 through 11. Very interesting passage of scripture. It says, how that, <clears throat> how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when he read, he may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow hearers and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, in this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we see that in the ages past, the revelation of the church was not even known. Hence, you see, when the disciples ask the question, is it this time that you're going to actually restore us as a people? But they didn't understand what Jesus came to do. He came to pick out a people for himself. And so blindness is imparted to Israel for a time until the fullness of the Gentiles come into play, which is now this time in which we live the church age. Acts 15, 13 through 15 states what God is presently doing in the world. He is visiting the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. After he has taken out or raptured a people for his name, he will return and build again the tabernacle of David, Israel, which is falling down as he promised and as the disciples were anticipating in the days of his flesh when he came to this earth. Romans eleven twenty five. 25, for I would not, brethren, that he should be ignorant of this mystery, lest he should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness, Paul says, is in part, in part, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile be come in. This phrase, fullness of the Gentiles, speaks to the rapture of the church. So right now, Israel is in part blinded while the church is why God is preparing a people for himself and preparing to pull them out of the earth. The tribulation period involves Israel. Jeremiah calls it the time of Jacob's trouble in, 30, in Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. It has to deal with God preparing unbelieving Israel to receive the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and to inherit the promised kingdom on earth. Remember, when he came unto his own, his own received him not. They rejected him, but a plan was in place to receive us, the Gentile, that becomes the church of the living God. But after the church has been raptured, he's going to now deal with his people. At that same time, God is going to destroy the Gentile world system headed by the Antichrist. Jesus Christ alone will be King of Kings and Lord of Lords because the Antichrist is going to be the last world leader. Last world leader you're going to see on the scene. Well, the church won't be here to see. We'll be out of here before that happens. But he's going to be the last world leader. And Jesus Christ is going to come and destroy that kingdom. And afterwards, he will set up his kingdom on the earth for the 1,000-year period. The judgment seat of Christ, our next objective. 
the church, having escaped the tribulation by means of the rapture, will then face what we call the judgment seat of Christ. All right, the Bible says, so we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. All right, so we're coming to a place called the judgment seat of Christ. So the church, when raptured, where we go is what we call the judgment seat. All right? Now, if any man builds upon this foundation gold and silver and precious stones, wood and hay and stubble, every man's work shall be, made, shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So what we're seeing taking place at the judgment seat is a time when man's works is going to be judged. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So when the, when, when the church is raptured and we get to that judgment seat, it's not a time for declaring, determine whether or not we're going to be saved. We are already saved at that point. It's a time to determine the kind of rewards that, go, that is going to actually be given out because God is going to now give us rewards because we're going somewhere and we need to re be ready to now cast our crowns at his feet. We're going to a coronation ceremony. And so we've got to now do the work while we're on this earth right now. Um, as it relates to our salvation, that was taken, that, that was that God took, took, um, took care of that on the cross of Calvary. So when we accepted that and was baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, that's what brings us into the kingdom of God. But once we get into the kingdom of God, it's time for us to do the work of the Lord. We're not working for salvation, but we're working because of what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. And so the Bible says we're saved unto good works. So we're going to now begin to do the work that the Lord commissioned us to go and go into the world and to preach the gospel and to reach the lost and dying. And it is that work that is going, uh, that is going to be rewarded. So we need to ask ourselves some question then. If it is that we're expected to do something, how wisely did we spend our time is what we need to ask ourselves. Did I use the time that I have wisely while I was here on earth? What were our, our priorities? What did I place first in my life? Was Jesus Christ the first, the number one, as he spoke to the church in Ephesus? Were we faithful stewards of the talents, the times, and the blessings entrusted to our care? Because these are going to be judged. We are stewards. We are custodians of another man's property. God has given us things. He has given us giftings, and he expects us to use those giftings to honor his name. Our time, our talent, our treasure is going to be questioning us as to how we use them. Did we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Did we strive to become like Christ and to do his will? Were his interests placed ahead of our very own? We're talking about our works that are going to be judged. So we question ourselves in this time, while we are yet to be raptured, how we live our lives so that we can be ready to meet and to receive from the Lord. The marriage supper of the Lamb. So having assigned each person rewards and place of service in the coming kingdom, the most glorious event of our lives will be consummated. It's the marriage of the Lamb. All right? We, have been, we know that we are called the bride of Christ. And the Lord is coming back. So we're going to the marriage ceremony, all right? Where the marriage is going to be consummated. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, right. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we're going to the wedding. This is our wedding day. 
Jesus Christ will be joined with his bride, the church. And so because of the joy that was set before him, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, he endured, he endured the agony of the cross. You see, while he was on the cross, he saw what was coming. He knew us who would have accepted him as Lord and Savior and will be saved to be saved in the future. He endured the agony of the cross. And at last, we shall enjoy his presence, not through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Because one of these days, face to face, we shall behold him. We shall see him as he is. And what a day we anticipate. We look forward to that blessed hope, that blessed day, when the, that which we've been longing for, that which we've been living for, it's all about Jesus. It's not even so much about heaven. It's about Jesus. Because should we get there and Jesus is not there, then it's not worth it. But once Jesus is there, that's all that really matters. Oh, I want to see him. The songwriter says to look upon his face. Hallelujah. What an opportunity. What a glorious day it will be. The wedding ceremony in heaven will be followed by the thousand year reception on earth. So after we come back, then we have the reception period on the earth, the 1,000 year reign with the Lord. And that is referred to as the millennial period. All right, the church is reign, the church reign with Christ. And so while the bride and the bridegroom are being united in marriage, the world will be experiencing the worst judgment since the world began. That's what we referred to earlier as the tribulation. Indeed, if Jesus does not intervene, there will be no one left on the earth. And except those days should be shortened, the Bible says, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Matthew 24, 22 tells us that. The elect in this verse refers to Israel, as in Isaiah 45 and verse 4. And so Christ is going to return to save Israel, right? As we see in Romans 11, and set up his kingdom on earth. And the church, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, will return with him, as in, as in, as in, in Revelation 19, 14 through 16. We're going to be reigning with him. Like Jude said, Enoch saw this glorious event. Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all. We are coming back to reign with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, even on this earth. But before we get there, we got to be ready to go with him before, we got to be ready now and be ready for his return because he's coming back for us. He went away not to stay, but he's coming back again. Am I ready? Are you ready? Are we ready for this great and notable day it's what we've been longing for. It's what we've been looking for. We want to hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. Oh, I want to see him. I want to experience him for who he is. The one I've been serving. The one who died for me. The one who shed his precious blood so that I could be forgiven. So that we could be forgiven. We anticipate and look forward for that great and notable day is coming. Praise the name of the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.